Chapter Nineteen of Old Old Fairy Tales, Prince Desire and Princess Mignonetta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There was once upon a time a king who was passionately fond of a princess, but she could not be married because she was enchanted he went to consult a fairy to ascertain what he ought to do to make the princess love him the fairy said to him you know that the princess has a large cat of which she is very fond well she can marry that person only who can succeed in treading on her cat's tail the prince said to himself that will not be very difficult to accomplish and he quitted the fairy determined rather to crush the cat's tail than to fail in treading on it he hastened to his mistress's palace master puss came to meet him very consequentially as was his wont the king lifted up his foot but when he thought to have put it on the cat's tail puss turned round so quickly that he trod on nothing but the floor he was a week trying to tread on this fatal tail which appeared to be full of quicksilver for it was continually moving but at last the king had the good fortune to surprise master puss one day when he had his head in a jar in which a rat had taken shelter and trod upon his tail with all his weight puss turned mewing horribly and immediately took the shape of a tall man who looking at the prince with eyes full of anger said to him you may now marry the princess since you have dissolved the enchantment which prevented you but i will be revenged you shall have a son who will always be unfortunate until the time when he shall become aware that his nose is too long and if you take any umbrage at what i threaten you you shall immediately be put to death although the king was frightened at the sight of this tall man who was an enchanter he could not help laughing at his threat if my son's nose should be too long he said to himself unless he should be either blind or silly he will certainly be able to see or feel it when the enchanter had disappeared the king went to find the princess who consented to marry him however he did not live long with her for he died eight months after the wedding a month after his death the queen gave birth to a young prince who was called desire he had the finest large blue eyes in the world and a pretty little mouth but his nose was so large that it covered half his face the queen was inconsolable when she saw this large nose but the ladies who were with her told her that the nose was not so large as it appeared to her to be that it was a roman nose and that history averred that all heroes had large noses the queen who loved her son to excess was charmed with this discourse and by dint of continually looking at desire his nose no longer appeared to be so very long the prince was brought up very carefully and as soon as he could speak all kinds of shocking stories were told him of people who had short noses no one was allowed to remain near him whose nose did not a little resemble his own and the courtiers to show their respect to the queen and her son pulled their children's noses several times a day with a view of lengthening them they had however a difficult task for their sons appeared to have hardly any nose at all near prince desires when he became old enough to understand it he was instructed in history and whenever any great prince or handsome princess was mentioned to him he or she was always spoken of as having a long nose the room was hung round with pictures in which all the figures had large noses and desire grew so accustomed to regard length of nose as an ornament that he would not for an empire have parted with an atom of his when he had reached the age of twenty it was thought expedient for him to marry and the portraits of various princesses were submitted to him he was in raptures with that of mignonetta the daughter of a great king an heiress to several kingdoms of the kingdoms however desire thought not at all he was so much struck with her beauty the princess mignonetta although he was thus charmed with her had a little turned-up nose which harmonized admirably with her other features 
but which very much perplexed the courtiers they had acquired such a habit of ridiculing small noses that they sometimes could not forbear laughing at that of the princess but desire would not suffer a jest on this subject and he banished two courtiers from his presence who dared to make insinuations against mignonetta's nose the others warned by their fate were more cautious and there was one who said to the prince that in truth a man could not be pleasing who had not got a large nose but that it was not the same in respect to woman for a wise man who spoke greek had informed him that he had read in an old manuscript that the fair cleopatra had the end of her nose turned up the prince made a magnificent present to the courtier who told him this good news and dispatched ambassadors to demand mignonetta in marriage his proposal was accepted and he was so anxious to see her that he went more than nine miles on the road to meet her but as he was just stepping forward to kiss her hand the enchanter appeared and carried off the princess before his face leaving him quite inconsolable desire resolved never to re-enter his kingdom until he had discovered mignonetta he would not allow any of his courtiers to accompany him and mounting a good horse he laid the bridle on his neck and allowed him to choose his own road the horse presently came to a large plain which he traversed the whole day without seeing a single house both horse and rider were ready to die with hunger at last as night was about to set in they discovered a cave in which a light was burning desire entered and saw a little old woman who appeared to be more than a hundred years old she put on her spectacles to look at the prince but she was a long time adjusting them for her nose was too short the prince and the fairy for it was a fairy burst out laughing as they looked at each other exclaiming simultaneously oh what a comical nose not so comical as yours said desire but madam let us leave our noses as they are and have the goodness to give me something to eat for both i and my poor horse are dying with hunger with all my heart answered the fairy although your nose is ridiculous you are not the less the son of my best friend i loved the king your father like my own brother but he had a very handsome nose and what is there wanting in mine asked desire oh it wants nothing answered the fairy on the contrary there is but too much of it but no matter a man may be very good and yet have too large a nose i was saying then that i was your father's friend at that time he frequently came to see me and you must know that in those days i was very pretty your father told me so i must repeat to you a conversation that we had together the last time he saw me very well madam said desire i will listen to you with a great deal of pleasure when i have had my supper consider if you please that i have eaten nothing to-day the poor child is right said the fairy i did not think of that i will prepare your supper and while you are eating i will tell you my history in a few words for i do not like long tales a long tongue is still more insufferable than a large nose and i remember when i was young that i was admired for not being a great talker the queen my mother used frequently to have it mentioned to her for such as you see me i am a great king's daughter my father your father ate when he was hungry said the prince interrupting her yes he did doubtless said the fairy and you also will have your supper in a moment i was merely going to tell you that my father but i will not listen to a word until i have something to eat said the prince growing angry he checked himself however for he wanted something of the fairy and said i know that the pleasure i should take in listening to you would make me forget my own hunger but my horse who will not understand you is in need of some food the compliment made the fairy bridle you shall wait no longer she said to desire calling her domestics you are very polite and in spite of the size of your nose you are very amiable plague take the old woman with my nose said the prince to himself one would have sworn that my mother had stolen what is wanting in hers to make mine with if i were not hungry i would leave this prate pace who fancies that she is a little talker 
one must be very stupid not to perceive one's own defects that comes of her being born a princess flatterers have spoiled her and persuaded her that she is a little talker while that was passing in the prince's mind the servants laid the table and the prince wondered at the fairy who kept asking them a thousand questions solely to have the pleasure of talking he was especially surprised at a waiting woman who in everything that she saw praised her mistress for her discretion egad thought he as he was eating i am delighted to have found my way here this example demonstrates to me how wisely i have acted in not listening to flatterers who praise us princes very shamelessly concealing our defects from us or representing them to us as perfections but as for me i shall never be their dupe i know my own defects heaven be thanked poor desire quite thought he was right and little imagined that those who had praised his nose had ridiculed it in their hearts as the waiting woman was ridiculing the fairy for the prince observed that she turned her head aside every now and then to laugh with regard to himself he did not say a word but ate away as fast as he could prince said the fairy to him when he began to be satisfied move a little i entreat you your nose makes so large a shadow that it prevents me from seeing what is on my plate by the way with regard to your father i went to his court when he was quite a child but it is forty years since i first retired into this solitude tell me a little how things are going on at court now are the ladies still fond of running about in my time they used to go on the same day to the promenade to the assembly to the theatre to the ball but how long your nose is i cannot grow used to it in truth madam answered desire do not say any more about my nose it is as it is and in what does it concern you i am contented with it and do not wish that it was any shorter every one to his taste oh i perceive now that i have hurt your feelings my poor desire said the fairy but i did not intend to do so on the contrary i am your friend and i wish to do you a service but notwithstanding that i cannot help being shocked at your nose i will not however mention it to you again i will even constrain myself to think that you are snub-nosed though in truth there are materials enough in it to make three reasonable noses desire who had finished his supper grew so tired of the fairy's tedious prattle about his nose that he sprang on his horse and rode away from the cavern he continued his journey and wherever he went he thought that everybody was mad for everybody talked about his nose nevertheless he had been so accustomed to hear it asserted that his nose was handsome that he could not reconcile himself to the idea that it was too long the old fairy who wished to do him a service in spite of himself determined to shut up mignonetta in a crystal palace and place this palace in the prince's road desire transported with joy strove to break it but he could not succeed in despair he wished to approach near it so as at least to speak to the princess who on her part stretched her hand close to the crystal wall of the palace he was very anxious to kiss her hand but turn his head which way he would he could not place his mouth near it his nose constantly preventing him he then perceived for the first time its extraordinary length and feeling it all over with his hand i must confess said he that my nose is too large at the moment he pronounced those words the crystal palace vanished and the fairy appeared leading mignonetta by the hand and saying confess that you are greatly obliged to me i vainly wish to speak to you about your nose but you would never have acknowledged its defect unless it had become an obstacle to your wishes in this way self-love conceals from us all of the defects of our minds and bodies in vain reason endeavors to unveil them to us we can never perceive them until the same self-love that blinds us to them finds them to be opposed to its interests desire whose nose had become an ordinary nose profited by this lesson he asked mignonetta to become his wife married her 
and they became a sincerely attached couple they never parted without grief and the tenderest embraces and in this union of affection they continued till age and death crept on them the happiest of kings and queens End of chapter 19 Chapter 20, Part 1 Princess Minikin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Victoria Kahn The Old, Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine Princess Minikin once upon a time there lived a king and a queen who had only one son in whom they centred all their hopes he was fourteen years old at the time from which this history commences and the queen had given up all hopes of having any more children the prince was handsome to admiration and learned with facility all that was taught him the king and queen doted on him and their subjects made him the object of their tenderest affection for though he knew very well what distinction was necessary to observe toward the several persons who approached him he was affable to all he was called zirphil as he was their only son the king and queen resolved that he should marry young that they might hope to see princes his sons worthy of wearing their crown if unfortunately zirphil should be taken from them search was accordingly made on foot and on horseback for a princess worthy of the heir apparent but notwithstanding a suitable partner for him could not be found at last after many inquiries had thus been made the queen was informed that a lady very closely veiled requested a personal and private interview with her majesty in order to confer with her on a very important affair the queen hastened to her throne to receive her and gave orders for her to be ushered into her presence the lady on being admitted walked up to the queen without removing her large white veil which reached from her head to her feet and entirely concealed every part of her person when she had arrived at the foot of her throne i am astonished o oh queen said she that you have even dreamed of marrying your son without consulting me i am the fairy marmotta and my name is too well known for you not to have heard of me i am mortally offended and as a commencement of your punishment i command you to marry your son zirphil to a person whom i have brought hither for that especial purpose with these words she fumbled in her pocket and pulled out a small toothpick case this she opened when there issued from it a little enameled doll so pretty and so nicely made that the queen in spite of her grief could not forbear admiring its beauty this is my goddaughter continued the fairy and i have destined zirphil from his birth to be her husband the queen burst into tears and conjured marmotta by the most tender entreaties not to expose her to the laughter of her subjects who would ridicule her indeed if she were to announce to them such a marriage what do you mean by ridicule madam said the fairy ah we shall see whether they have any occasion to ridicule my goddaughter and whether your son ought not to adore her i assure you that she is worthy of him in every respect that she is small is true but she has more wit than all the people in your kingdom put together and when you hear her you will be surprised yourself for you must know that she can talk and to some purpose come little princess minikin said she to the doll talk a little to your mother-in-law and show her what you can do then the pretty minikin skipped on to the queen's tippet 
and complimented her in so tender and intelligent a manner that the queen suspended her tears and affectionately kissed the little princess here your majesty said the fairy is my toothpick case you can replace your daughter-in-law therein i wish your son to accustom himself to her society before he marries her however i do not think it will require a very long time your obedience may soften my anger but if you disobey my orders you your husband your son and your kingdom shall all feel the effects of my resentment and above all do not fail to replace her very early every evening in the case for it is of great importance that she does not sit up late with these words the fairy lifted up her veil and the queen fainted away with terror on perceiving a real living marmot covered with black hair and having a head as large as an ordinary woman her attendants came to her assistance and when she recovered from her swoon she only saw the case which marmotta had left she was conveyed to bed and the king was informed of her indisposition he hastened to her apartment in violent agitation the queen desired all her attendants to quit the room and with a torrent of tears related what had transpired to his majesty who would not believe a word she said until he saw her draw forth the doll from her little case good heaven cried he after meditating a few moments is it possible that kings are liable to such severe misfortunes alas we are only placed higher than other men to feel more acutely the sorrow and misfortunes inseparable from this life and to show greater examples of fortitude sire interposed the doll in a soft and clear voice my dear minikin said the queen you talk like an oracle the king took her hand and kissed it finally after an hour's conversation between these three personages it was agreed that nothing should as yet be said about the marriage and that they were to wait until zirphil who was then absent for three days on a hunting expedition should determine to obey the fairy's orders which the queen undertook to make known to him meanwhile the king and queen paid the utmost attention to little minikin she had a highly accomplished mind she spoke exceedingly well and with a peculiarly lively turn which was engaging however notwithstanding her animation her eyes had a certain motionless stare which was not agreeable and which the queen only overlooked as she began to love the little princess she was however fearful that the prince might conceive an aversion to her on this account more than a month had passed after marmotta's visit and the queen had not yet dared to introduce zirphil to his proposed bride when one morning that prince entered her apartment before she had risen and seating himself by her bedside spoke as follows a few days ago madam while i was hunting the most surprising adventure conceivable befell me which i would fain have concealed from you but the secret has become so burdensome to me that i feel i can withhold it from you no longer it is now some days since that as i was eagerly following a wild boar i became so absorbed in its pursuit as not to observe that i had outstripped all my attendants when as i arrived at the outskirts of the forest i all at once saw the animal precipitate himself into a large opening in the ground into which my horse plunged after him i felt myself descending into the earth for about half an hour when my horse's hoofs came suddenly in contact with the floor looking about me i saw instead of the wild boar which i confess i was somewhat fearful of meeting a very ugly woman who begged me to alight from my horse and follow her i did not hesitate and giving her my hand she opened a little door which i had not before perceived 
and i entered with her into a green marble saloon in the middle of which stood a large golden tub covered by a piece of rich cloth this she raised and i saw in the tub a lady of such surpassing loveliness that i could with difficulty preserve myself from falling backward with surprise prince Zerfil, said the lady who appeared to be bathing the fairy marmotta has enchanted me here and it is by your aid alone that i can be freed speak madam said i inform me how i can serve you you must replied the lady either pledge yourself to marry me immediately or scale me alive my surprise at the first proposition could only be equalled by my horror at the alternative she observed my embarrassment and continued do not imagine that i am ridiculing you or that i am making a proposal that you will have any reason to repent accepting no zerville do not be alarmed but i am an unfortunate princess for whom the fairy has conceived a violent hatred and whom she has metamorphosed into a creature half woman half whale because i refused to marry her nephew the king of the whitings a young man the ugliness of whose person is only equalled by the wickedness of his actions the fairy has condemned me to remain in the state in which you now see me until a prince named zirphil shall have fulfilled one of the conditions i have just proposed to you to bring this about i caused my lady of honour to take the shape of a wild boar this morning in order to attract you hither you know how my design has succeeded but i must now inform you that you will not be allowed to quit this place until you have complied with either one or the other of my requests this i cannot avoid and citronetta whom you have already seen will confirm to you the truth of my words conceive madam said prince Zerfil to the queen who was listening with the greatest attention into what a state this speech threw me although i thought that the princess was very beautiful and although her beauty and misfortunes made her extremely interesting the idea of a whale princess inspired me with horror on the other hand the thought of scaling her alive made me frantic but madam said i at length for the silence into which her discourse had thrown me was becoming as insupportable as it was unmannerly is there no third means of accomplishing what you desire i had no sooner pronounced these unlucky words than the princess and her attendant began to utter such piercing shrieks and lamentations as almost rent the roof of the saloon ingrate barbarian tiger everything that is most ferocious and inhuman said she you would then add to my punishment the horror of seeing you expire for know that if you do not resolve at once to comply with my request the fairy has assured me that you will perish and that i shall remain in my present condition all my life her reproaches pierced my heart she drew her beautiful arms from the water and clasped her lily-white hands to entreat me to decide quickly citronetta threw herself at my feet and embraced my knees almost deafening me with her clamorous grief but how can i marry you said i how can the ceremony be performed in the first place ah scale me she said tenderly and do not marry me at all i shall be quite as well pleased scale her said the attendant redoubling her entreaties and trouble yourself no further i was in an inexpressible perplexity and when i attempted to reflect how to act their cries and tears only increased my confusion at last after a thousand conflicting thoughts i looked again on the beautiful whale princess and her beauty triumphed i knelt near the tub and taking her fair hand no adorable princess i exclaimed i will not scale you i prefer to marry you the princess joy at hearing these words was visible on her countenance but 
it was a modest joy for she blushed and with downcast eyes she said i shall never forget the service you are about to do me i am so penetrated with gratitude to you that you cannot ask me for anything that i will not grant you in return come lose no time cried the impatient citronetta but inform prince zirphil what remains for him to do it is only necessary said the whale princess blushing again for you to give me your ring and to receive mine here is my hand receive it as a pledge of my faith no sooner had i made this tender exchange and kissed her fair hand that i found myself on my horse in the middle of the forest where i was soon rejoined by my attendants and i returned to the place mute with astonishment every evening since this took place i have been transported without knowing by what means into the handsome green marble saloon where i passed the night in company with an invisible person who says she is my bride and who converses with me on the subject of our union but ah my son interrupted the queen and is it possible that you are really married yes but although i am very fond of my wife madam resumed the prince i would have restrained my passion for her if i could have disenchanted her without either marrying her or scaling her alive as Zerfil pronounced these words, a small voice was heard from the queen's pocket, saying, "'Prince Zerfil, you should have scaled her, and your pity will perhaps be fatal to you.' On hearing this voice, the prince was quite speechless with astonishment. In vain the queen attempted to conceal the speaker from him. He immediately fumbled in the pocket which was lying on an armchair which stood near the bed, and drew forth the case which the queen took from his hand and opened princess minikin then stepped from it and the prince in surprise kneeling down by the queen's bedside to look at her more closely exclaimed would you believe madam that this is the miniature counterpart of my beloved whale princess the queen then informed her son of all that had passed on the fairy marmotta's visit at which Zerfil could not forbear showing a surprise not very flattering to Minikin. But she was so good-natured that when she saw the queen's affliction she kissed her hand and could not refrain from tears. Zerfil was touched by this tender scene, and asked Minikin for her hand to kiss in its turn. With much grace and dignity she extended it to him, and then re-entered her case when zirphil had left the queen she rose from her bed to inform the king of what she had heard and of what she had just witnessed that they might take every reasonable precaution against the probable effect of the fairy's anger the following night prince zirphil notwithstanding that his bodyguard had been doubled was carried off as the clock struck twelve and found himself as usual in company with his invisible princess but instead of being greeted with kind and tender language as heretofore he heard weeping and sounds of grief and observed that the princess kept a considerable distance from him he ran after her round the apartment until he was tired when seating himself on a sofa he exclaimed what have i been guilty of that i deserve such unkind treatment i know all said the whale princess in a voice choked by sobs and great have you forgotten the tenderness with which you kissed the hand of the princess minikin the tenderness returned zirphil quickly ah divine princess are you so little acquainted with mine as to accuse me on so slight a ground if i looked at minikin attentively it was only because her face exactly resembles yours and being deprived of the pleasure of seeing you all that resembles you fills me with delight conceal yourself no longer my dear princess and be sure that i will look at none but you the invisible princess seemed to be consoled by those words and drawing near the prince forgive me said she 
this little jealous suspicion i have reasons enough to dread being separated from you to be afflicted at anything that seems to forebode that misfortune but said zirphil can you not inform me why you are not permitted to make yourself visible to me or if i have delivered you from marmotta's tyranny how is it that you are still under enchantment alas said the invisible princess if you had chosen to scale me we should have been much happier but you felt so much horror at that proposition that i dared not press you more by what means interrupted zirphil is minikin acquainted with what has happened for she said nearly the same thing to me no sooner had he pronounced these words then the whale princess uttered a piercing shriek and sprang off the sofa and the prince in astonishment did so too but what was his terror when he perceived the hideous marmotta in the middle of the apartment holding his beautiful princess by her flowing ringlets no longer invisible no longer half a whale he drew his sword but his princess with tears and supplications entreated him to moderate his anger as it would be of no avail against the fairy's power and the horrible marmotta gnashing her teeth there issued from her mouth a violet-coloured flame which singed his whiskers prince zirphil said the fairy to him a fairy who guards you prevents me from exterminating you your father your mother and all who are related to you but you shall at least suffer in what is most dear to you for marrying without having consulted me and your torments and those of your princess shall not cease until you are submitted to my power as she finished these words the fairy disappeared together with the princess the apartment and the palace and prince zirphil found himself in his own room in his night-dress and with his drawn sword in his hand he was so astonished and so beside himself with anger that he did not observe that it was freezing for it was then the middle of winter on hearing his outcries his guards rushed into his chamber and requested him either to go to bed or allow himself to be dressed he chose the latter and went straight to the apartment of the queen who on her part had passed the night in the most dreadful anxiety on going to bed the queen was unable to sleep and being troubled with sorrowful thoughts she resolved to impart them to the little minikin with that purpose she took the case but in vain she shook it minikin was no longer there the queen fearful that she had lost her in the garden rose from her bed and gave orders for torches to be lighted and a search to be made immediately but in vain they searched minikin had vanished and the queen returned to her bed in a transport of grief with which she was overwhelmed when her son entered her apartment he was himself in such affliction that he did not perceive that his mother was in tears the queen therefore when she noticed his agitation said ah doubtless you are come to announce some terrible calamity yes madam answered zirphil i am come to inform you that i wish to live no longer if i do not find my dear princess how oh, my son said the queen are you already in love with that unfortunate princess what with your minikin said the prince is it possible that you can even suspect me alas my dear whale princess has been torn from me for her only i wish to live and marmotta the cruel marmotta has dragged her from me ah my son said the queen i am still more afflicted than you are for if you are deprived of your whale princess i have to regret the loss of my minikin who since last evening has disappeared from the case then the queen and zirphil related to each other the misfortunes that had befallen them the king was promptly informed of the queen's despair and outcries and also of his son's sorrow he entered the apartment in the midst of the scene we have described and informed himself of what had occurred 
as he was very sagacious, the thought immediately struck him to have Minikin advertised and to offer a large reward to whoever should bring her to the palace. Everybody thought this an admirable expedient, and the queen herself, notwithstanding her sorrow, was obliged to agree that no one but the most transcendent genius could have hit upon so singularly felicitous a scheme. Accordingly, handbills were printed and distributed and the queen consoled herself with the hope of soon receiving intelligence of her little princess as for zirphil the loss of minikin interested him as little as her presence he came to the resolution of seeking out a certain fairy of whom he had heard and having obtained permission of the king and queen he set out immediately attended only by his equerry the country in which the fairy lived was situated at an immense distance from that of the prince but neither time nor obstacle could stop the amorous impatience of the young zirphil he passed through kingdoms and countries out of number nothing particular occurred to him because he was determined that nothing should for beautiful as cupid and brave as a lion adventures would have befallen him if he had been willing to seek them at last after he had been a year on his travel he arrived at the borders of the desert in which the fairy resided he alighted from his horse and left his equerry to await his return in a little hut with orders not to be impatient for his coming he entered on the desert which was indeed frightfully solitary it was inhabited only by owls but their dismal screechings did not dismay the soul of our courageous prince sustained by his unconquerable intrepidity and by the hope of meeting with the beneficent fairy he did not hesitate an instant but penetrated into that region which until then had never been trodden by mortal feet after night had set in he perceived afar off a light which made him think that he was approaching the fairy's grotto for no one but a fairy could reside in that horrible desert he continued to direct his steps toward it during the whole of the night and at last about daybreak he discovered the celebrated grotto he arrived at the foot of a prodigiously high rock which seemed to be of fire such was its brilliancy it was a carbuncle of such an immense size that the fairy had a very spacious residence therein when prince zirphil had reached her grotto the fairy effulgent appeared to him he prostrated himself before her when she desired him to rise and follow her into the grotto prince said she to zirphil a power equal to mine has partly counteracted the happiness with which i endowed you at your birth but you may expect everything from my protection you must have as much patience as courage to overcome armada's wickedness i can tell you no more at least madam answered the prince do me the favour to inform me if the beautiful whale princess is unhappy and if i may hope to see her again soon she is not unhappy said effulgent but you cannot hope to see her again until you have pounded her in the mortar of the king of the whitings oh heavens cried zirphil is it possible madam that she is in his power alas then i have to dread the effects of his passion for her in addition to the horror i feel at having to pound her with my own hands arm yourself with courage answered the fairy and do not hesitate to obey me on that all your happiness will depend and also that of your wife she will die if i pound her continued the prince and i would sooner suffer death myself go said the fairy and make no reply every moment that you lose adds to marmotta's fury hasten to the king of the whitings tell him that you are the page promised him by me and rely on my protection then effulgent pointed out to him on a map his road to the court of the king of the whitings and dismissed him after apprising him that the ring he had received from his whale princess would instruct him how to act when the king gave him anything difficult to perform 
he set out and after journeying several days arrived at a meadow close to the seaside where there was moored a little sailing boat built of mother of pearl and ornamented with gold he looked at his ruby ring and saw his shadow sitting in the boat so he jumped on board and having unmoored it the wind drove it out to sea he was soon out of sight of land and after being driven before the wind for several hours the boat stopped at the foot of a crystal palace built on piles he sprang on the landing place and entered a court which led to a superb vestibule and to a numerous suite of apartments all the walls of which were rock crystal admirably engraved presenting the most charming effect imaginable this castle was the palace of the king of the whitings and its only inhabitants were men with fishes heads the prince had no doubt as to where he was he felt his collar rising but he controlled it to ask of a turbot who looked like a captain of the guard where he could find the king of the whitings the man turbot gravely motioned him onward and zirphil passed into the guard-room where he saw a thousand men with pikes heads under arms who fell into a double rank for him to pass through at last after making his way through an infinite crowd of menfish he came to the presence chamber he did not hear much noise in his progress for the menfish were dumb while he observed that the greater part of them had heads like the whitings the prince saw in the ante-room several who appeared to be of high rank from the crowds which surrounded them and from their own important looks zirphil had reached the king's closet just as the council which was composed of twelve men with sharks heads was leaving his majesty presently the king himself appeared he had like so many of his court the head of a whiting but he also had fins on his shoulders and from the waist downward was a real whiting he had the gift of speech and his only garment was a scarf of golden fish skin which looked very splendid on his head he wore a helmet shaped like a crown whence depended the tail of a codfish which served him instead of a plume of feathers four men whitings were carrying him in a bowl made of japanese porcelain about the size of a bathing tub and which was filled with sea water one of the greatest ceremonials at the court and which was scrupulously exacted by the king was the refilling of this bowl twice a day by the peers and dukes his attendants this employment was however considered a great honor and was much sought after the king of the whitings was very tall and looked more like a monster than anything else after replying to some of those about him who had brought him petitions he perceived the prince who are you my friend said his majesty what accident has brought a man here may it please your majesty answered zirphil i am the page whom the fairy effulgent promised to send to you oh i understand said the king laughing and showing his teeth which looked like those of a saw let him be taken to my seraglio and let all my crawfish be shown him every morning he must choose ten from among them pound them in a mortar and make me some broth sir phil was conducted to the seraglio and while reflecting on his singular situation he saw the doors open and ten or twelve thousand crawfish enter the room and arrange themselves in straight lines nearly filling the apartment the thought struck him that he might be able to discover his beautiful and unfortunate whale princess among them as the hideous marmotta had ordained that he should pound her in a mortar why should i have to pound them said he except it is to drive me mad but never mind let me try to discover her cried zirphil that i may at least die of grief before her face then he asked the crawfish if they would allow him to search among them for one with whom he was acquainted she who appeared to be the chief mounted on a table and said we are not aware that there is such a one among us sir but you may search until it is time for us to return to our pond 
where it is absolutely requisite that we should pass the night zirphil commenced his researches but it was like looking for a needle in a bundle of hay and he only learned from those he interrogated that they were all princesses who had been transformed by the wicked marmotta he was inexpressibly grieved on hearing this and to think that he would have to choose ten of them every day for the king's broth it was now getting late and they informed zirphil that it was time for them to return to their pond but it was not without pain that the prince should consent to forego the pleasure of searching however fruitlessly for his dear princess he had not been able during the whole day to speak to more than one hundred and fifty but as he was at least certain that she was not among those he resolved to take ten from their number he did so and having taken them to a man pike who was the head cook the latter inspected them and brought zirphil a green porphyry mortar and a golden pestle and having shown the prince how to place them he made signs for him to begin pounding he was about to do so when the bottom of the mortar opened amid shouts of laughter and sent forth a bright flame which dazzled the prince's eyes for a moment and then expired leaving the bottom of the mortar as before zirphil looked into it but nothing was there the crawfish had disappeared at which he was very much astonished but withal pleased for he did not relish the idea of having to pound them the man pike seemed to regret what had taken place and wept bitterly the prince was as much surprised at seeing the head cook's grief as at the laughter of the crawfish but he could not learn what occasioned either as the crawfish were gone and the man pike could not speak prince zirphil pondering on what he had witnessed returned to his pretty apartment where he no longer saw the crawfish they having returned to their pond the next morning when the crawfish entered he again sought for his princess and not finding her he chose ten of the finest of them and took them to the kitchen the same adventure occurred as before the flame came from the mortar the crawfish disappeared laughing and the man pike wept a similar occurrence happened every day for three months but as zirphil heard no more of the king of the whitings his only sorrow was that he could not find his beautiful whale princess one evening as zirphil was returning from the kitchen to his room he had occasion to pass through the palace gardens as he passed near the palisade which surrounded a charming grove in the middle of which was an artificial cascade he heard the sound of voices which not a little surprised him for he thought all the inhabitants of that country were dumb like those he had seen he walked more softly and heard a voice say but my princess so surely as you never discover yourself so surely your husband will never recognize you what would you have me do said the other voice which zirphil immediately recognized as one which he had so often heard the tyranny of marmotta obliges me to act as i do and i cannot discover myself without endangering my life and his the wise fairy effulgent who sent me there conceals me from him for the purpose of preserving us for each other it is absolutely necessary that he should pound me it is an irrevocable decree whence comes it that the prince must pound you said the other you have never consented to relate your history to me though the unfortunate citronetta your confidant would have informed me of it if she had not been selected last week for the king's broth alas replied the whale princess that unfortunate creature has then already undergone the fate which awaits me would that i were in her place surely she is now in effulgence grotto do said the other voice since it is so fine an evening inform me why are you submitted to marmotta's vengeance i have already told you who i am and i repeat that i am burning with impatience to learn your history well said the princess although it will only renew my grief i cannot refuse to satisfy you besides i shall have to speak of zirphil 
and I abandon myself with joy to all that can recall his image to my mind. It is easy to imagine the prince's joy at overhearing this tender confession. He softly glided into the grove, and, as it was now quite dark, he could neither see nor be seen. He listened, however, with the utmost attention, and overheard as follows. My father was king of a certain country situated near Mount Caucasus. He governed as well as he could a people of incredible wickedness. Insurrections were perpetually shaking his throne, and the windows of his palace were frequently shattered to pieces by stones intended for himself. The queen, my mother, who was very clever and highly accomplished, composed for him harangues to appease the rioters, but if he were successful one day on the next there was infallibly another insurrection the judges were tired of condemning to death and the executioners of hanging and beheading the criminals at last things arrived at such a crisis that seeing all his provinces in rebellion and his people in arms against him my father resolved to retire into the country that he might no longer witness the dreadful condition of his affairs he took his queen with him, and left the kingdom to be governed by one of his ministers, a man wiser and of bolder spirit than the king, my father. Our wicked subjects lighted bonfires at their departure, and the next day strangled the minister, declaring that he wanted to act the king, and that they preferred even their old one to him. My father was not at all flattered by their preference and did not therefore quit the retirement of his little country house where i was born i was called minikin because i was very small and as the king and queen tired of honors that had cost them so dearly wished to conceal my birth from me they brought me up as a shepherdess at the end of ten years which appeared to my parents no longer than ten minutes so contented were they with their retreat the fairies who inhabited mount caucasus indignant at the persevering wickedness of the inhabitants of my father's late kingdom resolved to restore it to order one day as i was tending my flock in the meadow that joined our garden two old shepherdesses accosted me and entreated me to give them a night's lodging they looked so weary and so sorrowful that i instantly took compassion on them come said i to them my father who is a shepherd will be willing to receive you I then ran to our cottage to tell him that they were coming. He went out to meet them and received them very kindly, as did the queen, my mother. I then collected my sheep and fetched some new milk for our guests, and while my father was preparing something nice for supper, the queen, who, as I have already told you, was very intelligent, entertained them with her conversation. I had a little lamb, of which I was excessively fond my father told me to bring it to him that he might put it down to roast i was not in the habit of refusing to do as i was desired so i fetched my lamb immediately but i was so afflicted that i ran to my mother and burst into tears she was however so much engaged in talking to the good women that she did not observe me what is the matter with little minikin said one of them seeing me in tears alas madam said i to her my father is about to roast for you my little pet lamb what said she who had not spoken is it for us that they are going to be so cruel to the pretty minikin then rising from her seat she struck the floor with her wand and there instantly appeared a table on which was spread a magnificent feast at the same time the two old shepherdesses were transformed into two ladies so handsome and so glittering with jewels that i was motionless with surprise at seeing them my father and mother immediately began to testify their respect for the two fairies for you may be sure that fairies they were raising them from their feet where the king and queen had thrown themselves king and queen said the more majestic of the two we have known you for a long time and your misfortunes have excited our pity do not think that a high station is exempt from the evils attendant on human life you ought to know from experience that the higher the rank the greater the liability to misfortune 
your patience and virtue however have lifted you above your hard fate and it is time they should be rewarded i am the fairy effulgent and i am come to ask you what can most contribute to your happiness speak and do not be afraid of putting our power to the test consult together and your wishes shall be accomplished but do not let your request have reference to minikin her destiny is apart from yours the fairy marmotta jealous of the brilliant career before your daughter has condemned her to obscurity for a certain period but minikin will be better able to appreciate the happiness of life after she shall have known some of its evils we will protect her and mitigate her fate this is all we are permitted to unfold to you now speak anything that you can ask shall be granted the fairies were silent after this harangue the queen turned to the king and requested him to make answer for she was in tears at learning that i was destined to be unfortunate but neither was my father in a condition to speak he uttered lamentable cries and i seeing my parents weep quitted my lamb to join my tears to theirs the good fairies affected by the extreme grief which prevailed in the royal family spoke a few words apart then effulgent who had already spoken said to the queen be consoled madam the misfortunes with which minikin is threatened are not so bad since they will terminate happily for from the moment that the husband we have destined for her shall have performed what fate shall require of him minikin will be happy for the remainder of her life and our sister will have no further power over either of them we have allotted her to a prince who is every way worthy of her all that remains for us to say is that it is absolutely necessary you should lower your daughter every morning into the well and let her bathe there during the space of half an hour if you scrupulously observe this rule perhaps your daughter may avoid the misfortune with which she is menaced and it is at the age of twelve years that her destiny will be fulfilled if she reach thirteen without its coming to pass there will be no longer anything to fear so much for minikin for yourselves express but your wishes and they shall be gratified End of chapter 20, part 1chapter 20 part 2 princess minikin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by vittoria khan the old old fairy tales by laura valentine princess minikin the king and queen looked at each other and after a short silence the former requested to be changed into a statue until my thirteen probationary years should be accomplished while the latter confined her wishes to requesting that the temperature of the well in which i was to be bathed might always be adapted to the season the fairies charmed with this excess of tenderness granted in addition that the well should be filled with orange flower water and that the king whenever the queen should throw some of this water over him should resume his natural form and be changed into a statue again whenever he should wish then the fairies took their leave of us after having praised the king and queen for their moderation they disappeared and i felt grief for the first time in my life at seeing the king my father become a large statue of black marble the queen gave way to tears and i also but at last as everything has an end i ceased to cry and only thought of consoling my mother for my mind was highly intellectual and my heart capable of the deepest feelings the queen passed nearly all her time at the feet of the statue and i after being bathed according to the fairy's instructions went regularly to milk our sheep this milk formed our principal food for the queen was too weak to have an appetite for anything else indeed it was her, only her love for me that made her wish to prolong a life which seemed so unfortunate alas my child my child would she say to me occasionally 
of what avail to us has been our high rank for she no longer concealed from me my birth would not a less elevated station have been preferable to a crown attended with such grievous misfortunes virtue alone joined to my affection for you my dear minikin enables me to support them but there are moments when my soul seems anxious to quit my body and when i confess that i feel a pleasure in the certainty that i must die i was regularly bathed every day and my mother was very much afflicted at seeing the king always remain an inanimate statue however she dared not recall him to life for fear that she should only cause him the grief of witnessing my predicted misfortune the fairies not having specified in what way my fate was to affect me we were in a dreadful state of anxiety the queen in particular her imagination having a vast field for its exercise foreboded to her the most frightful misfortunes and had no bounds to its fears for my part i soon ceased to think upon the subject so true is it that youth is the only season in which we enjoy the present my mother was continually saying that she had a great mind to recall the king to life which i advised her to do at last at the end of six months seeing that the fairy's bath had made me very beautiful and had improved my understanding which was maturing from day to day she resolved to gratify herself in order as she said to give the king the pleasure of seeing me so she desired me to fetch her some water from the well accordingly the next morning when i had bathed i brought up with me a jug filled with this miraculous water and the moment that my mother sprinkled some drops of it on the statue my father became a man again the queen threw herself at his feet to ask his pardon for disturbing his repose my father raised her and embraced her tenderly peace was concluded and she presented to him his daughter the king was delighted with me and lavished on me a thousand caresses then turning to the queen he asked her if she had any news alas said my mother how should any reach me in this desert well then said the king you shall hear some from me for i have not been asleep all this time as you supposed the fairies who protect us have shown me that my subjects have been terribly punished for their wickedness my kingdom being transformed into one vast lake and the inhabitants into so many men-fish a nephew of the fairy marmotta whom they have placed upon the throne persecutes them with unceasing cruelty he eats them up for the slightest offence at the end of a certain period the exact duration of which is unknown to me a prince will come who shall reign in his stead and in the kingdom which will be then re-established minikin will enjoy a long life of happiness that is all i have learned and i have not passed my time very idly said the king laughing to have learned so much we passed some time very happily indeed the king and queen however were rather sorrowful when they remembered that i was approaching my thirteenth year as the queen was very careful to bathe me every day she still hoped that the prediction would not be fulfilled but who can boast of having evaded his destiny one morning the queen having risen early while she was plucking some flowers to adorn our mantelpiece for the king was very fond of flowers she saw crawling from under a tuberose tree an ugly animal something like a marmot the beast sprang at my mother and bit her nose when she fainted away with pain and the fright caused by so sudden an attack my father uneasy at her absence went to seek her and you may judge of his horror at finding his wife weltering in her blood and nearly dead he uttered frightful cries which soon brought me to his assistance and between us we bore the queen to our cottage and laid her on her bed where she lay insensible for two hours at last she began to give signs of returning consciousness and in a few moments we had the extreme pleasure of seeing her perfectly restored except that the wound she had received was exceedingly painful her first question was whether i had been bathed but we had been so much engaged attending to her that i had forgotten my bath on hearing this 
my mother was dreadfully alarmed but seeing that no accident had as yet befallen me she soon became tranquil and related to us the particulars of her misfortune at which we were very much surprised however the day passed without any other mischance the king had taken down his fowling piece and made a diligent search after the vile brute but in vain he could not find it the next morning at daybreak the queen arose and took me to the well she lowered me therein as usual but alas oh fatal and miserable day at that moment the sky although still perfectly serene echoed with a dreadful thunder while the day was rendered more brilliant by a fearful lightning and there issued from a burning cloud which suddenly arose a fiery dart which rushed into the well terrified my mother quitted her hold of the cord that held me and i was precipitated to the bottom of the well when i immediately became sensible that the lower half of my body was transformed into so much of an enormous whale i swam about for a short time and then began calling on the queen with all my might she did not answer at which i was very much afflicted and i was crying very bitterly as much for the loss of my mother as at my metamorphosis when i felt an unknown power forcing me to descend and having arrived at the bottom of the water i entered a crystal grotto in which i observed a sort of nymph shaped like a frog but exceedingly large and rather dirty however she smiled when she saw me and said minikin i am the nymph of the bottomless well and am called citronetta i have orders to receive you here and to make you perform the penance to which you are doomed for having omitted your bath follow me and make no reply she took hold of my tail and dragged me unresistingly into a green marble saloon which was near her grotto and there placed me in a golden tub full of water when i began to recover my spirits the good nymph appeared to be in ecstasies i informed her of the events of my life and then begged her to tell me what was become of the king and queen she was about to answer me when a frightful marmot as large as a human creature entered the saloon and froze me with horror she walked upright on her hind legs leaning on a golden wand she came up to the tub in which i would fain have drowned myself i was so terrified and touched me with her wand minikin she said to me you are in my power and nothing can withdraw you from it but your obedience and that of the prince whom my sisters have destined to be your husband listen to me and divest yourself of your fear which does not become the daughter of a king from your infancy i wish to protect you and marry you to my nephew the king of the whitings effulgent however and two or three more of my sisters had already taken upon themselves to provide you with a husband and angry in consequence i let the effects of my ill-humour fall upon you having no power over my sisters i resolved to punish you for their stubbornness and so ordained that you should be transformed into a creature half woman half whale for at least the half of your life my sisters cried shame on such injustice so i was induced to diminish the effects of my vengeance but for my complaisance i reserved to myself the determination of marrying you to my nephew effulgent who is somewhat imperious and whose power is unfortunately superior to mine would not hear of this reservation because she had destined you for a prince who was under her protection i was accordingly obliged to accede to her wishes notwithstanding my resentment and all that i could obtain was that the one who should deliver you from my power should become your husband these are their portraits added the fairy handing to me two golden cases you will know them by their likenesses and if one of them should come to deliver you it is necessary that he should promise to marry you in your present condition and in order that you may quit it he must tear off all your scales one by one 
otherwise you will remain half a fish all your life my nephew will not have the slightest objection to this proposition but with regard to the protege of effulgent he will not at all like the latter condition for he appears to me to be a very delicate young gentleman employ then your utmost address to make him scale you and that achieved your misfortunes will cease if indeed it be a misfortune to be a very beautiful whale fat and well fed with water up to your neck this speech to which i made no reply made me very sorrowful both on account of my metamorphosis and of the scaling i was doomed to undergo marmotta disappeared leaving us the two boxes which contained the portraits i was weeping at the thoughts of my unfortunate situation quite regardless of the boxes when the kind and compassionate citronetta said come let us not lament misfortunes which it is not in our power to remedy let us amuse ourselves by examining the portraits with that she opened one of the two boxes and showing it to me we both uttered a shriek of horror on seeing the portrait of an ugly whiting on which however the artist had bestowed as much beauty as he could but still never in the memory of man was anything seen so frightful take the detestable object from my sight said i i cannot endure to look on it longer i would sooner remain a whale all my life than marry the horrible whiting my companion did not give me time to finish my imprecations on the monster see said she look at this young beauty i declare that he may scale you whenever he chooses and you will be but too happy to suffer by his hands i quickly turned to see if what she stated were true and was but too soon convinced a handsome and agreeable countenance presented itself to my sight tender and expressive eyes gave a finishing charm to a set of features in themselves noble and majestic i gazed on this charming portrait with a pleasure of which i was myself unconscious and which i had never felt till then citronetta was the first to remark it in good faith said she our choice is soon made i awakened the good-natured citronetta twenty times in the course of the night to converse with her about my prince and she soon found out his name for me and informed me that he hunted almost every day in the forest under which i was incarcerated she proposed to me that she should try to entice him to our abode but i would not consent although i was dying with anxiety to see it accomplished one day when i was more low-spirited than usual for love has this peculiarity that it disposes the tender heart to melancholy i saw the frightful marmotta enter the saloon accompanied by two persons whom i did not immediately recognize it instantly struck me that she was bringing her unlucky nephew and i uttered frightful cries they hastened up to me and i heard the wicked marmotta say why she could not make more noise if they were scaling her she cries out before she is hurt good heaven sister said one of the persons who accompanied her and in whom i recognized with joy the two fairies who had formerly visited my father's cottage let us hear no more for the present about the scaling but let us tell minikin what we have got to say to her oh by all means said marmotta but you know the conditions the good fairy without heeding or replying to her words spoke to me as follows minikin we are too much afflicted by your unhappy condition not to endeavour to change it and especially as you have not deserved it i and my sisters have therefore determined to lighten your misfortune as much as may be in our power our scheme is this you are going to be presented at the court of the prince to whom i have destined you from your cradle but my dear child you will not appear there in your present form although you are destined to return to it three times a week and pass the night in your tub for until you are married and scaled 
interrupted the hideous marmotta with a sardonic grin the good fairy turned toward her shrugged up her shoulders and immediately continued for until you are married you will remain a whale here more than this we cannot tell you but you will learn all in good time above all be very careful to keep your secret for if a single word escape you which has a tendency to make it known neither i nor my sisters can assist you more and you will be wholly in the power of my sister marmotta which she will be said that wicked fairy i already see her in my clutches a secret kept by a girl indeed would be a phenomenon that is her business said effulgent for it was she who had been speaking to me all along as to the rest my daughter she continued you will be changed into a little enamel doll but will retain both reason and speech and we will preserve your real features and now i give you a week to consider whether what i have proposed be agreeable to you there wanted only one day to the fairy's appointment when citronetta who had assumed the shape of a wild boar and had gone to the forest to procure me news of zirphil returned followed by that too amiable prince i cannot express to you my joy at seeing him there are no words expressive enough to convey even a distant idea of what i felt but what delighted me most was to perceive that the prince appeared enchanted with me at least i inferred so from his looks citronetta more anxious for my happiness than for our momentary transport dissipated it by proposing to prince zirphil to marry me or to scale me brought back to recollection and feeling the danger of our situation i joined my tears and entreaties to citronetta's and by our supplications we induced the prince to pledge to me his faith we had no sooner exchanged rings than he vanished unaccountably from my sight and i found myself in my proper shape lying in a comfortable bed i was no longer troubled with the thoughts of being metamorphosed still i was confined in the bowels of the earth in the green marble saloon and citronetta had lost the power of quitting it and of transforming herself i expected the return of the fairies with fear and trembling marmotta appeared at daybreak unaccompanied by effulgent or her companion and not looking more angry than usual she touched me with her wand without saying a word and i became a charming little doll when having put me in her toothpick case she transported herself to the palace of the queen my husband's mother she gave me to her with orders to espouse me to her son or expect all the misfortunes that lay in her marmotta's power to draw upon her adding that i was her goddaughter and called the princess minikin i conceived a very strong friendship for my mother-in-law i loved her for her good qualities independent of her being the mother of my adored zirphil and i was blessed with her friendship in return i was transported however every night to the green marble saloon in company with my husband i cannot divine why i was forbidden to tell him my secret since i was married to him however i did keep it notwithstanding zirphil's impatience to learn it you are about to see continued the speaker sighing that it is impossible to avoid the doom of fate however she added it is nearly daybreak and i am dreadfully fatigued with being so long out of the water so let me return to the pond and to-morrow at the same hour if we are not chosen for the broth of the wretched king of the whitings we will resume the thread of my story come let us be moving Zirphil heard no more, and returned to his apartment, very sorrowful at not having apprised his princess that he was so near her, but the fear of increasing her misfortunes by his indiscretion consoled him for not having attempted to do so. However, the dread of her perishing by his own hands made him resolve to resume his inquiries among the crawfish, and to learn their histories prince Zirphil went to bed but not to sleep he could not close his eyes all night 
to have discovered his princess to see her in the shape of a crawfish and in danger of being sacrificed to appease the appetite of the king of the whitings seemed to the prince to be a more dreadful punishment than the death to which he believed she was destined he was in a cruel state of agitation when a loud noise was heard in the garden at first zirphil only heard it faintly but on listening he distinguished the sounds of flutes and conch shells he sprang out of bed and looked through the window when he saw the king of the whitings accompanied by the twelve men sharks who had composed his council walking in the direction of his pavilion zirphil hastened to open the door and the procession having entered the king in the first place had his tub refilled with fresh sea-water by the lords who were carrying him then after a few minutes rest he took his place in the council and addressed the young prince as follows whoever you may be you are apparently resolved that i shall die of hunger for you send me day after day such wretched broth that i cannot swallow a spoonful then turning to an attendant his majesty added go to my kitchen and bring me the crawfish mortar i would regale the council a man pike immediately ran and fetched what the king desired and while he was gone the twelve men sharks took a large net and cast it through the window into the pond catching three or four thousand crawfish during the interval in which the council was employed fishing and while the man pike was gone for the king's pestle and mortar zirphil was absorbed in reflection he felt that the most critical moment of his whole life was at hand and that the question of his happiness or misery was about to be determined but summoning all his fortitude and resolution he prepared to obey the king the council ceremoniously presented the crawfish and the prince attempted to pound some of them but a similar adventure happened with these as had occurred with those which he had attempted to pound in the kitchen the bottom of the mortar opened and flames devoured them the king of the whitings and his rascally courtiers amused themselves for a long time with the extraordinary spectacle taking great pains and apparently receiving much pleasure in continually refilling the mortar until at last there was only one of the four thousand crawfish remaining this was so large and plump that it was charming to look upon the king gave orders that some one should chill it in order that he might eat some portion of this at least and it was accordingly handed to zirphil who was not a little grieved at this new cruelty but his grief was redoubled when he saw the poor crawfish join its two claws and when its eyes streaming with tears it said to him alas zirphil what have i done to you that you are about to treat me so cruelly the prince deeply moved by the words and with a heart pierced with grief looked sorrowfully at the crawfish at last he took upon himself to entreat the king to allow it to be pounded the king jealous of his authority and unshaken in his resolution was inflamed with anger at this humble petition and threatened to have zirphil himself pounded if he did not immediately shell the crawfish the poor prince again took it from the hands of one of the men sharks to whom he had entrusted it and with a little knife which was handed to him began to shell it but no sooner had the knife touched it than the crawfish uttered so piercing a cry that the prince turned away his eyes and could no longer repress his tears after a while however he continued his disagreeable task but to his astonishment before he had well finished shelling the crawfish it changed in his hands to the vile marmotta who leaping on the floor convulsed with loud and disagreeable laughter mocked at zirphil's grief the prince however was at sight of her relieved from the oppressive fear under which he had been laboring and which had nearly made him swoon the king in astonishment cried out what is it possible that i behold my aunt yes truly it is herself said the tormenting creature but my dear whiting i have come to inform you of terrible news his majesty turned pale on hearing these words 
and the council assumed an air of satisfaction which quite disconcerted the king and his frightful aunt it is all over my darling continued marmotta and you must return to your watery kingdom for this obstinate creature has taken it into his head to be so ridiculously constant that i can do nothing with him he has avoided all the snares that i laid in his way in the hope of diverting him from his determination to carry off the princess whom otherwise i had destined for you on hearing these words the king of the whitings went into such an excess of fury that words cannot describe it he committed a thousand extravagances which made it very apparent that he was the prey of violent and ungovernable passions marmotta in vain attempted to appease him neither threats nor entreaties could prevail he broke his china bowl in a thousand pieces when all the water escaping he swooned away marmotta beside herself with anger then turned to zirphil who had been a passive spectator of the violent scene and said you have conquered zirphil by the assistance of a fairy who is my superior in power but all your sorrows are not yet over you cannot be happy until after you have restored to my possession the case which contained the unlucky minikin effulgent herself has granted me that and i have obtained from her that you shall suffer until then with these words she threw the king of the whitings over her shoulders and bundled him into the lake together with the men sharks the palace and all its inhabitants and in a moment zirphil found himself alone at the foot of a high mountain which stood in the midst of a large desert in which there was not the least sign of vegetation nor of a human habitation he looked in vain for the lake and the palace all had disappeared at once the prince was more afflicted than astonished at so extraordinary an event he had become familiarized with prodigies and was only sensible of the grief caused him by marmotta's persecution i cannot doubt soliloquized zirphil that i have pounded my princess yes i have pounded her and am no happier than i was before ah barbarous marmotta and you effulgent too even you leave me without assistance after i have obeyed you at the sacrifice of all that so sensitive a heart as mine holds dear his grief and the weariness consequent on his having passed the previous night in the grove made him feel so excessively faint that he would have most probably perished but that his courage was unequalled and his love inspired him with a wish to live after walking onward for a long while our prince came to the brink of a well which was cut through the rock here zirphil sat down to rest himself and began again to call on his protectress oh effulgent said he have you deserted me after repeating these words several times he heard a voice proceeding from the well say if zirphil is there let him speak to me the prince's joy at hearing this voice was increased by a hope that he recognized it as one to which his ear had been accustomed he sprang to the brink and answered therefore yes i am zirphil and you are you not citronetta i am said the voice and citronetta immediately arose from the well and embraced the prince words cannot paint zirphil's joy at seeing her he overwhelmed her with questions relative to herself and the princess and it was some time before the transport occasioned by their meeting being over they spoke more rationally i am about to communicate to you said citronetta all that you are anxious to learn since you pounded us we have enjoyed a happiness which your absence alone renders incomplete and i was here awaiting your arrival by the directions of the fairy effulgent that i might instruct you as to what remains for you to do in order to become the happy possessor without further trouble or fear of a princess whose love for you equals that which i know you feel for her but 
as some time must of necessity elapse before you can arrive at that happiness i will do myself the pleasure to relate to you that part of the wonderful history of your amiable spouse of which you are as yet unapprised zirphil kissed repeatedly the hands of citronetta in token of his thanks and followed her into her grotto at the sight of which he was overcome with tender recollections when he recognized it as the saloon in which he had for the first time seen his adored whale princess at last having seated himself and partaken of a repast which was furnished for him by his ring he requested the good citronetta to resume the history from the place where the princess had finished her narration as effulgent will come to seek you here said the nymph you shall in the meantime learn all that you wish to know know then that the fairy marmotta was not ignorant of your marriage but she had transformed our mutual friend into an enamelled doll thinking that you would be disgusted with her in that shape effulgent herself was however as you have heard at the bottom of that affair and well knew that no power could deprive you of the princess if you married her or destroyed her enchantment by scaling her you married her and you know what has since taken place the last time that you saw the princess and myself we were transformed into crawfish and placed in a little basket made of rushes which marmotta hung on her arm when seating herself in a chariot drawn by two adders we were speedily conveyed to the palace of the king of the whitings this palace had formerly belonged to the king who is the father of your princess the city changed into a lake formed the place where we have inhabited ever since and all the men-fish whom you saw were the wicked subjects of that good king the latter requesting to be made yeoman of the kitchen and keeper of the pestle and mortar to the king of the whitings effulgent gratified him by giving him a tap with her wand when he immediately became a man-pike such as you saw him in the discharge of his duty now you need no longer be surprised at the tears you saw him shed when you brought the crawfish to be pounded for as he knew that his daughter had to undergo that punishment he always feared that she might be among those which you brought him from time to time and the unfortunate king had not a moment's peace because his daughter had no means of making herself known to him for the queen she requested to be transformed into a crawfish in order to be with the princess and her wish was likewise granted with regard to ourselves when we arrived at the palace the fairy presented us to the king of the whitings and commanded him to have a basin of crawfish broth prepared every day after which order we were thrown into the pond among the rest at length you arrived and we were presented to you but we were not permitted to make ourselves known unless you should interrogate us and we dared not infringe the law so tired we were of submitting to its rigour for having formerly disobeyed it in mere trifles we were selected by you one morning i and the queen and we had not time to bid the princess adieu ere you carried us to the kitchen we had scarcely touched the bottom of the fatal mortar when effulgent herself came to save us and on restoring me to my proper shape she transported me to this my usual residence i had the consolation of seeing the queen and our companions likewise restored to their proper persons but i do not know what has become of them the fairy embraced me and told me to await you here and inform you of all that i have just told you when you should arrive here in search of the princess i had been looking forward to the present moment with impatience as you may well believe sir continued citronetta to prince Zerfil, who was listening to her attentively until at last yesterday just as i had seated myself at the mouth of my well effulgent appeared our children will soon be happy said she to me my dear citronetta zirphil must restore to marmotta her case as an end to his labours for he has scaled the princess ah great queen cried i are we then so happy as to have an end to our fears yes said she you are indeed zirphil thinks he has only scaled marmotta but he has in reality scaled the princess as marmotta 
being concealed in the handle of the knife wherewith he performed his terrible sacrifice at the moment that he finished shelling the crawfish rendered the princess invisible to his eyes and substituted herself marmotta in her place what exclaimed zirphil and was it then my charming princess to whom i acted with so much cruelty alas have i been barbarous enough to make her suffer this cruel punishment oh heavens she will never forgive me nor do i deserve her forgiveness the unhappy zirphil spoke so wildly and appeared so grievously afflicted that the poor citronetta was herself grieved that she had communicated to him this cruel piece of intelligence so said she at last seeing the prince in a reverie so you did not know this i did not indeed answered zirphil for had i known it was my princess i would rather have stabbed myself to the heart with the unlucky knife but reflect said citronetta that if you had stabbed yourself to the heart the princess would have remained for ever in the power of her enemy and of your detested rival and that it is much better to have shelled her than by killing yourself to have allowed her to remain miserable this last argument founded on the real state of the question soothed the prince's grief and citronetta prevailed on him to take a little food to keep himself alive just as they had finished their little repast the vault of the saloon opened and a fulgent appeared seated in a car made of a large carbuncle and drawn by a hundred butterflies she alighted assisted by the prince who bathed the hem of her robe with a torrent of tears the fairy raised him and said prince zirphil you will this day reap the fruit of your heroic actions be comforted at last you will enjoy true happiness i have overcome the fury of marmotta by my entreaties and your fortitude has disarmed her come with me to receive your princess from her hands and mine ah gracious madam cried the prince throwing himself on his knees am i not in a dream is it possible that so much happiness can be real do not doubt it said the fairy come with me sir to your kingdom to console the queen your mother for your absence and for the death of the king your father your subjects are impatient to crown you the prince felt notwithstanding his joy a very lively grief on hearing the news of the king his father's death but the fairy to withdraw him from his sorrow seated him by her side in her car and allowed citronetta to establish herself at their feet then her butterflies displayed their brilliant wings and took the direction of zirphil's dominions on their route the fairy desired him to look inside his ring he did so and found in it the case that he had to restore to marmotta the prince thanked the generous effulgent a thousand times and they presently arrived at the kingdom where they were awaited with so much impatience the queen zirphil's mother came to assist the fairy to alight from her car and all the people on being instructed of the prince's return made such long and hearty acclamations that they partly dissipated the prince's grief he tenderly embraced the queen and they adjourned to a magnificent apartment prepared by her majesty for their reception which they had no sooner entered than marmotta arrived in a little chariot lined with spanish leather drawn by winged white rats she brought with her the fair minikin in all the beauty of her natural figure together with the king and queen her father and mother effulgent and zirphil's mother went out to receive and embrace marmotta and the prince walking respectfully up to her presented the toothpick case and kissed her paw which she extended to him with a gracious smile marmotta then permitted zirphil to embrace his wife and to present her to his parent who embraced her with transports of the most lively affection a general interchange of civilities then took place among the numerous persons comprising this illustrious assemblage and joy reigned in every breast minikin and her charming husband alone spoke not so much as they had to say to each other their silence had a certain touching eloquence which affected every one present 
the good Citronetta shed tears of joy as she kissed the hands of her divine princess. At last, Effulgent took them both by the hand, and leading them to the queen, Sir Phil's mother, "'Behold, madam,' said she, two young lovers who only await your consent to complete their happiness. My sister, the illustrious king and queen here present, and myself, all join to request its fulfilment. The queen, of course, consented in terms suitable to so polite a speech. Then Marmotta touched the fair minikin with her wand, and her dress, which before had been magnificent, was immediately changed into one of silver brocade, embroidered all over with gold, and her beautiful hair instantly arranged itself into a coiffure of such exquisite taste that the kings and queens declared her dazzling charms to be absolutely perfect. In the meanwhile, the toothpick case, which the fairy held in her hand, became a crown of brilliant diamonds, so beautifully set and so bright that the apartment and all the palace received a new lustre as marmotta placed it on the prince's head the prince in his turn was dressed in a suit which perfectly matched with minikin's attire and from the ring which he had received from that princess there issued a crown exactly like hers they were immediately married and proclaimed king and queen of that fine country the fairies provided the royal banquet at which, as may be expected by those who know their extreme liberality, nothing was wanting. After staying a week with the young king and queen, and loading them with gifts, they departed, and restored Minikin's father and mother to their kingdom, the inhabitants of which had been so severely punished for their faults that they had become a loyal and faithful people. With regard to Citronetta, the fairies gave her permission to spend some time with her beloved mistress, and also arranged that Minikin, by expressing a wish, might have the pleasure of seeing the nymph whenever she pleased. The fairies having taken their departure, never were two persons so happy as King Zerphil and Queen Minikin. Their felicity was in themselves and in each other, and their days flew by unmarked in their course, for all was joy. They had children who blessed them by their goodness, and they attained an extreme old age, their mutual affection and desire of pleasing each other increasing with their years. After their decease, their kingdom was divided, and, after innumerable vicissitudes, it has become, under one of their descendants, the flourishing empire of the great Mogul. End of chapter 20, part 2